Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Randy Pugh, I'm the director of the Naval Warfare Studies Institute, uh, and I'm going to be presenting today on lessons learned from Ukraine. This is, I think, the fifth in this series that we've done. Uh, just looking at what are the uh, what are the lessons that are being learned in the Russo-Ukrainian war uh, that we should be uh, learning vicariously, so that we don't have to learn them ourselves. So we started the presentations with robots and drones. We did deception and decoy. Uh, we did um, uh, integrated air and missile defense. Uh, and the last one that we did was the use of commercial space. So how many electronic warfare experts in the room? Somebody doing like information warfare curriculum? All right, good. Yeah. So, so this is intentionally called a sea power conversation, not a Randy Pugh getting up and presenting things to you conversation. So I'm looking to uh, throw some things up on the screen to provoke uh, thought uh, to, to be uh, you know, interesting and, uh, and some creative things that are happening in Ukraine. But I'm as interested in hearing from you and your thoughts about uh, what is presented or other things that you've seen uh, as much or more than I am in, in completing, you know, getting through my 20 slides or whatever. So please raise your hand, interrupt me as we go. Uh, I, we're doing this on MS Teams and we're recording it. So if you do have a question or you have a comment that you want to make, just let me know. I'll bring you the microphone so that the people online can uh, can hear your comments. So next slide, please. This is just a uh, this is a quick agenda of what I'm going to talk about, and I tried to structure it as uh, you know, let, let's all agree on what electronic warfare is. There's also electromagnetic spectrum operations and electromagnetic maneuver warfare and a bunch of other terms. I'm old school. Uh, I prefer to just stick with electronic warfare. And then I'm, I was going to walk you through some things that I've gleaned from the news. This is all unclassified, not even CUI, uh, that will um, it'll kind of walk through like, hey, this is like EW101 or kind of things that we, we've known in the past. They were tools or techniques that have worked reliably. Uh, since uh, the turn of the century, and that is the, the 20th century, not the 21st century. And then 201 are some of the evolving things that are happening uh, in Ukraine that like make you tilt your head like a dog hearing a high-pitched noise that are actually re like really interesting and clever. Uh, and then there's some 301 things that, uh, that I'll present at the end that are you know, these these are things that uh, that are not maybe just evolutionary, but might be revolutionary. So, uh, again, interrupt me as we go with questions or uh, or comments. Uh, my intent was to go about 30 minutes uh, with these examples and then, you know, open it up for for conversation uh, for the second half, uh, but not going beyond the hour. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, so EW, uh, according to um, you know 100 and 25 years or so of uh, of history, are consists of the three parts uh, that you see up there, which is electronic protection, electronic attack, and electronic warfare support. Um, I list the fourth one is signals intelligence. So the difference between electronic warfare or electronic warfare support. Uh, and signals intelligence is really the you know the analytical aspect that goes into it. So signals analysis, for example, on the SIGINT part will allow you to understand targets in a way that then can be kind of lifted and dropped down to the secret level onto the electronic warfare support side. So e EP, uh, once upon a time, uh, was called ECCM or electronic counter countermeasures. Everybody, has anybody heard of these before? Yes, just a few. Yeah, so once upon a time, you had uh, electronic countermeasures and then electronic counter countermeasures. So, uh, and then there were electronic counter counter countermeasures, counter 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 counter, counter, counter measures, uh, as you sought to protect your own command and control, your own communications links, uh, your own uh, ability to, uh, to issue orders and to get reports from lower echelons. Um, and then there was the, you know, then there was the, uh, the attacking part of that. And so uh, those those aspects uh, that get pulled out of this manual, I pulled this once upon a time, there was a thing called the Marine Corps Institute. They were correspondence courses that all Marines could take. You'd order it and uh, someone in Quantico would put it in a, in a cardboard box and mail it to you. Uh, and then it had a test at the end and you would receive this and you would take it. So 
all Marines uh, would end up, certainly the communications Marines or the signals intelligence Marines would end up taking this, uh, this Marine Corps in Institute course, this MCI, and it would teach them all about electronic warfare. Uh, I, I like it because it has like all this old terminology in there that's still relevant. And then uh, over on the right hand side, uh, hard to see, but uh, you, you'll have the slides uh, after this, but it's like some cartoonist or something uh, drew a picture of a modern battlefield uh, with all of the emitters and all of the signals intelligence systems and all of the uh, electronic attack systems uh, that would be on that uh, on that battlefield, simple enough so that kind of everybody could understand it. That picture on the right uh, is fantastic uh, when you when you look at like one thing at a time. And so what I hope the the one of the maybe big themes of this brief is that electronic warfare, uh, you know, like warfare itself, like everything is simple and the simple things are really hard or whatever. So uh, next slide, please. So, so use of the EMS, when you think about the electromagnetic spectrum and the use of the electromagnetic spectrum, really I'm talking about the RF spectrum, not, you know, the washing machines at, you know, 20 Hertz, all the way to like whale songs and washing machines to, you know, light and lasers kind of thing, but really just talking about the RF spectrum. And most of what I'm going to present here is what's most interesting to me, because I got to make the brief, uh, which is not necessarily radars and the radar aspects of electronic warfare, uh, but more about the communications uh, aspects of, um, of electronic warfare. So those are some of the things across the top that, uh, that I think are obvious uses of the, of the electromagnetic spectrum or the radio spectrum. So military radios, everything from UHF, walkabout squad radios, um, you know, walkie talkies, uh, all the way up to uh, military grade uh, communications systems, you know, including network systems and digital systems. Uh, electronic warfare systems, and those come in, um, in kind of the two flavors. So there's the electronic warfare support kind of electronic warfare systems, and then there's the electronic attack kind of warfare system, electronic warfare systems. Uh, TDL is tactical data link, so uh, aircraft or ground-based uh, systems communicating with each other, sending parametric data or uh, sensor reports or those kinds of things being sent over tactical data links. I have a picture of a aircraft there, uh, but it could also be satellite communications, uh, you know, broadcast of in, Intel broadcasts, for example. Uh, GPS or GLONASS, uh, so uh, precision navigation and timing uh, is another use of the electromagnetic spectrum. Hopefully everybody knows how, uh, how GPS works. Um, and, then, uh, and then military radars, so you know, the use of the electromagnetic spectrum and the RF spectrum uh, to do either uh, search uh, or targeting or fire control, all of those kinds of things using the electromagnetic spectrum. And then, uh, and then some new things when you, uh, when you start thinking about the, the war in Ukraine and for the, anybody, Iraq or Afghanistan vet? Okay. Uh, yeah, or Syria or, um, you know, other, other places, you know, 21st century warfare. Certainly this idea of dual use and the, uh, and the ability to kind of lift and drop commercial communications technology onto the battlefield uh, is becoming ubiquitous. I wouldn't even say, you know, best practice or you'll see it on the battlefield. Uh, but the idea that uh, what the commercial world considers privacy, we consider uh, ComSec. And so uh, the, the technology, whether it's the encryption or whether it's the, uh, the how the signal is modulated, uh, you know, those kinds of things uh, are both you know, rapidly advancing and then are also you know, incredibly high quality and high reliability. So more and more commercial communications. And then the other one that I am you know, infatuated with, I guess, because you'll see a bunch of it in this, uh, in this uh, presentation is, is, the, uh, is unmanned aerial vehicles, or probably more, I, I think drones is the, the right word. Um, so uh, commercial off the shelf drones, DJI, uh, Phantom, Phantom Fours, um, you know, flying around the battlefield, and they use the electromagnetic spectrum uh, or the RF spectrum both for uh, command and control, so the ability of the operator, any drone pilots, anybody drone pilots, okay. So, um, you know, both for the control of the aircraft, understanding, uh, you know, being able to send it commands, 
And then also information about like where is the where is this the parametric data or metadata about the drone? So you know where is it? What's its altitude? What direction is it going? That kind of thing. And then also the video stream that uh, that's coming off the drone if that's uh, if that's how it's being used. So for example, FP, FPV or first person view. Um, can you go back, please. Sure. I'm sorry. Maybe. Oh God. There you go. Thanks. So that that also is being transmitted, uh, you know, through through the ether, right, through the RF spectrum. And uh, and the other one that I don't have on here, and because I couldn't find a lot on it, but another thing that I think you should be concerned about and be thinking about. Uh, so you have the Internet of Things. Everybody good with the Internet of Things? And then there's the Internet of Battlefield Things. And so increasingly, for example, you know, military tactical vehicles will have multiple sensors on them. They'll be connected to a, uh, a wireless network somehow. And then over the RF, they will be transmitting you know, information about that, that vehicle or that weapon system, or you know, the, like your toaster and your refrigerator will eventually be you know, connected to the internet. All the things on the battlefield, there is this desire or this vision to have them also all connected so that you can do things like um, predictive maintenance, uh, or you can do like predictive uh, resupply. So your, you know, your um, artillery um, position will like tell the supply system that it's running low on ammunition and what it needs resupplied without a human needing to inter intervene. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, Simpleton's view of uh, what I'm gonna be talking about through the rest of the slides, just so as you think in your head, you know, which part of this equation am I talking about? So you have a transmitter, you have a receiver, you have a jammer or electronic attack system, uh, and then you have the, the SIGINTERS, right? You have the, either it's electronic warfare support uh, or SIGINT that's, you know, that's listening. Uh, a couple of things to keep in mind. This is like, uh, I haven't even gotten to 101 yet. This is like the primer or whatever, which is, you know, you jam the receiver, not the transmitter. Yes. Okay. If anybody's smiling, uh, it's less funny when people are like, "Oh crap!" Never really realized that. That's a great point. Um, and then also, you know, you're you're listening to the transmitters. So the other arrow that could be on there is the signature listening to the jammer, you know, or an electronic warfare system listening to the jammer. So you know, emitters. I think that's actually. I don't want to spoil the surprise on my next slide. But emitters emit, you know, and receivers receive, uh, and jammers jam. Like if you understand those three things. It starts to uh, it starts to reveal some pretty cool things that uh, that you can do if you're clever. So this is uh, so this is the e EW 101 portion. And as I mentioned before, like this is like the kind of no kidding part, the, the non surprising part of what's going on uh, in Ukraine. So uh, the images, the upper uh, image in the upper left hand corner. Anybody? What is that? That guy's holding. Can you see? Yeah, like a drone defender or, or a, a different version of that. But as I was saying, the, uh, the, the drones, as they're flying, they get further. And everybody good with D squared when I say D squared? Anybody not know what I mean when I say D squared? OK, so, so D squared, it's, it's just uh, as, as you get further and further, the transmitter and the receiver get further and further apart. It's, you know, the power goes down exponentially as you, as you get further and further apart. Uh, and so, you know, as you get further and further, your uh, receiver or your transmitter, you know, there's the, that distance increases. It offers opportunity to get uh, an advantage in signal uh, from a jammer or uh, against that platform. So as a drone flies further and further away from its controller, uh, that signal is getting weaker and weaker. And then the opportunity to overwhelm that signal, either that's from the controller to the drone, uh, or it's that signal coming off of the drone back to the controller to tell the controller where that drone is or to transmit that video back and forth. And so that drone defender or like probably 50 or 100 different uh, versions of that now uh, looks to break that link, to basically overwhelm that link so that the signal, the, the desired signal from the controller to the drone uh, is overwhelmed by the jammer that's putting in, you know, uh, either just blocking it out through barrage jamming uh, or it's doing coherent jamming where it's actually 
you know, it understands the controls for that. And then you can take control of the drone and do whatever you want uh, with it once you have control over it. And then think the other way, you know, back to that first diagram, the signal that's coming off of the drone uh, can also be interrupted if you're near the receiving end. The receiving end on this, in this case, uh, would be the drone operator. Uh, this, the picture on the right hand side, uh, that is uh, shortly after the invasion of Ukraine, uh, that is the disruption of the, of the GPS. And so, um, trying to keep it all unclassified. Yeah, so, so there's a website that you can go to and pull this map down. And it will show you that uh, the Russians, you know, fearing retaliation, uh, were protecting their sites inside of Russia by disrupting the GPS and the GLONASS signal. So that should you uh, try to fly a drone there that's, uh, that needs GPS to understand, to know its location, uh, or you have some sort of GPS guided weapon, uh, as it gets within, you know, that signal gets overwhelmed by the jammer that is uh, jamming the GPS signal. That it, uh, that it won't be able to, uh, to determine its position or its position will be spoofed. So any, any questions or deep thoughts on, uh, on receivers received? Okay, next slide. All right, so, so the other one is, is transmitters transmit. And uh, as I was putting this brief together, like receivers receive and they don't, you know, and they're promiscuous or they don't care what they, you know, they don't really know what, who they're receiving from. All they know is what they receive. And the same thing for transmitters. Like transmitters transmit with a certain um, uh, intent or a certain uh, desired effect. Uh, but the, you know, the SIGINTERS or the Electronic Warfare uh, Support Specialists, uh, you know, they can also, they also receive that uh, transmission and they can do things with it. So the, uh, so the many examples of this, kind of the one that I like because you know, the first thing that we do when Marines go to the field is take away their cell phones, right? So uh, an instantaneous connection to every single human on the planet and access to every piece of human knowledge ever created is in your back pocket. And the first thing that we do when, you know, a Marine goes to the battlefield is take that away from them. Like, why would we, like, dumb down our Marines to grease pencils and maps or whatever? It's things like this. So uh, the Russians, you know, this is the story on New Year's Day. They had a barracks that was struck with a, uh, with a JDAM. Uh, and the, the story, including from the Russians, was is that it was uh, the Russian soldiers that went there and were living in that barracks had brought their cell phones with them, you know, against orders and, you know, were texting and surfing the Internet uh, on TikTok or something like that. And, and of course, any, any, again, any signatures in here? Okay. No, I'm just joking. So, um, yeah, so if you if you own the uh, the cellular system, the cellular network, uh, and you have access to all of the logs, uh, or you know you have a way to get that information, like your phone has at least two, usually more, at least three uh, unique pieces of identifying information about it that identifies you as like a first time user on this network, or hey, you are not from around here and you showed up on this network. And so, uh, you know, any, any Russian phone that was bought in Moscow, you know, by a soldier while he was on leave uh, that goes into Ukraine and connects to one of these networks, you know, immediately pops up uh, both, you know, you're a stranger, but then also, you know, which tower are you on and, you know, which panel of the, of the three antennas that are at the top of the network. Uh, which gives you a sense of, you know, then follow that back until it intersects a building. And you're like, well, oh, they're probably there. So anyway, um, this this is the kind of thing that uh, that is not hard to do. This is like very JV basic stuff. Next slide, please. All right. A quick question about yes, please. Go ahead. Um, I, so I'm a communications officer by trade. Uh, one of the things that they uh, Yep. Okay. I'm going to violate my own rule. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, C C2 guy by trade, certainly in the like introductory, like basic how to um, be worried about, uh, be worried about this sort of like transmit or transmitters transmit. We're worried about what we transmit, uh, direction finding this like in, uh, signals intelligence thing where, yeah, we can see where you're emitting from and locate that and figure out where you are. We were very concerned, um, that like any sort of 
RF transmission and by the Russians was going to be targeted. It made us take very um, like paranoid information security practices, like counter countermeasures, um, put all of our antennas thousand meters away from us, you know, all this different stuff. And it seems um, looking, you know, from a long distance way at this conflict, everyone's transmitting a whole lot and they're not immediately being blown up. And so all of our efforts to like shift onto HF or, you know, low RF or no RF comms. Um, do we still think as one of the lessons learned that that's like the correct direction for us to move in? Or I uh, give Randy's opinion. Yeah, so um, one of the Ukrainian uh, commanders was the, the mother, the, the Russians had found the mother's contact information through probably some kind of social media, called her and said her son had been injured. She turns around and calls her son and the Russians had that number. They use that to, so so you're right. I'm sure it's it's not everybody all the time, but certainly for people that they've identified on a certain type of watch list or something was able to give them targeting information, they uh, eliminated them, so. And maybe just came down to like our battalion or company level that this is going to happen to these maybe less priority target type units. Idea that yeah, that's I, I think you're starting to get at it, which is so there's uh, there's kind of legacy communications technologies. Uh, so like RF RFID, anybody heard of RFID before? Uh, like this idea that you can fingerprint a radio, uh, you know, a tactical radio, like a VHF radio. The truth is, is like uh, that radio, even if it's like really highly um, sophisticated manufacturing, as the radio gets warm because the sun's shining on it, or it, like it's been used for you know the last 20 minutes talking on the radio and it starts to heat up or it gets cold or whatever it is, it's like really, really hard to fingerprint a radio. So determining that that's you, this military unit associated with that radio is really, really difficult. Um, the more sophisticated technology, you know, as we get you know in, into commercial communications and then that technology gets integrated into military systems, it becomes a little bit easier. I would say the days of hiding in the noise floor, like in the clutter or whatever, like there's so much communications that, you know, there's not really a danger of, uh, of us being found within it is, especially with AI and big data techniques and things, uh, those days are going away. I think your generation should not count on like hiding in the noise floor. Um, and then, and then, you know, why are not all targets being serviced? It's a priority. You know, you only got so many, so many things that you can kill in a day. Uh, I don't want to be on a list anywhere. You know what I mean? And uh, commos. Okay. So there's certain things, and I don't go into it in this uh, in this presentation, but directional antennas, terrain masking. Uh, you know, use the lowest power possible. Like all of these things that were taught back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, still valid today, uh, even with you know digital technology. Because again, RF is RF, um, and even if it's dig digits, ones and zeros are that RF, it's still detectable. Um, you know, and then geolocation is a whole nother and like uh, and specific identification, specific emitter identification uh, are a lot harder. Um, so. <laughs> So as a uh, as a as a EW guy, I always love it when people are talking about jammers and you know, like you'll be doing an exercise with a bunch of very senior officers, and it's like a death ray, right? It's either like a bubble of jamming, and like, oh, sorry, you couldn't communicate because you were being jammed. Like, okay, can I know more about that, or does that just mean like I have to go back to the grease pencil and the and the you know and the acetate covered map? Uh, but but jammers are just powerful transmitters. So all this stuff that we talked about, about transmitters transmit and the vulnerabilities of transmitters transmitting, imagine if it's a jammer and so you're turning the power up to 11 and, uh, you know, and you're trying to overwhelm the, you know, in order to be uh, successful in jamming the receiver, like you have to turn it up higher than the transmitter that's trying to talk to that receiver. And so if you can play this first video, um, so there's a couple of ways to find jammers. Oh, you got sound, Rex. Is this the one with no sound? One of them, yep. Oh. 
Hold, please. Bottom right, we got sound on the computer. Yeah, can you... No? I'll narrate it in a Russian accent. You had it a minute ago. Radio Battalion's jamming us. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. But just play the video and I'll uh, I'll talk through it. Okay. So the so the use of drones and the use of GPS guided uh, weapons or weapon systems in Ukraine has made jammers that are jamming GPS or jamming uh, command and control links and things like that a high a high priority target a high payoff target. And so the video that you're looking at is they flew drone around right and they. Uh, listened, and it, it's as easy sometimes as doing like hot or colder. So I have this jammer that's broadcasting, and then I have three or four drones, and I get a signal uh, to noise ratio on each one of them on this certain frequency. And so I can find where that uh, where that jammer is uh, by just doing hot or colder. And you know the, the game as a kid. And so what they did is they found that jammer is up on top of a building. Uh, and again, more RF kind of 101 stuff in order to jam. You know, you want to have a good line of sight, RF line of sight, and you want to have good power and you want to have a directional antenna. And so they, uh, so that's what they did is they found this um, jammer system and then uh, took a drone and dropped a grenade uh, from the drone on top of uh, on top of that jammer. So next uh, next slide. All right. Uh, th this is another one. So the you can push play. So this one is uh, is similar, which is they had a report. It was a human report, and it was about a drone or a uh, jammer system being set up. Very uh, obvious and uh, and easily identifiable uh, antennas for these jammers set up on top of that building, and uh, and so that was passed off to uh, an ISR unit, which uh, did the targeting, and then. Uh, struck it with a uh, with a JDAM. Okay, next one. All right. Uh, there, there's another great video. I didn't get a chance to get it in here, but it is the the uh, the EW system and the kamikaze drone are on the you know in a single platform. And so it basically flew around and it found a directional antenna that was a uh, a jammer. And so the last two seconds of the video is it like flying into the jammer. So it just flies down the, the strongest signal uh, route. Okay, so that's uh, so that's EW101, like the, you know, don't don't be stupid or something like that, I think is uh, is the theme there. Uh, or or be dead kind of thing. So uh, yeah, RF uh, camouflage netting. Everybody knows there's two kinds of camouflage netting. There's the EO one that protects you from being seen, and then there's the RF kind that keeps you from, um, you know, from your signals from uh, being seen. And there's a uh, I saw an ad actually. Shell Johnson, one of the folks that works at NWSI, there's a Finnish company I think that's making RF netting that's selective in what RF frequencies it allows out, so that if somebody's looking at you with just a uh, you know with a sweep or like a stare at the RF spectrum. It will allow you to transmit and receive through the netting on certain frequencies, and then it will block other frequencies. So pretty cool uh, and sophisticated uh, EW. Next slide. All right, so I, I broke this down. The, um, the, 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 the whole, I think, idea, this EW is this cat and mouse game where it's e, e, ECM and then ECCM and then ECCCM and ECCCM. And you're constantly in this cat and mouse game of uh, both trying to find the enemy's uh, RF signal and either jam it or um, or you know or destroy the system itself. Uh, and then you know by doing so, you make yourself vulnerable to the other guy finding you and doing the same thing back to you. And so you do this leapfrog. Uh, Comsec is communications security. If you're not familiar, and it's broken down into those. 
four parts. So from the uh, from the uh, Russia-Ukrainian war, I thought this one was was interesting, which is these are like a guy that's living in his mom's basement or whatever it is, but they have a quick, uh, a cheap and easily available software to find radios. And all they're doing is monitoring the radio frequency spectrum with you know the antenna up on their grandmother's house, completely passive, right? So you're not risking yourself, you're not transmitting, you're just listening. Uh, and what the Russians are doing, because they're handing around these walkabout radios that are not encrypted, uh, they have come up with like clever terms like carrots and potatoes and you know mom mom needs groceries from the grocery store or something like that uh it, it takes a SIGIN analyst even a guy who lives in his mom's basement and has no professional training you know it it takes about you know two or three days to like figure out what all of that means by putting the intel reporting together with what was said uh and so you know the thought that you can talk around the subject or you can come up with your own clever code words or whatever it is um, is you know that 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 is not a thing. So uh, so the um, so the Ukrainians have uh, have done this, and they have monitoring stations. You know, amateur monitoring stations uh, scattered all over uh, throughout the battlefield. Okay, next slide. The other one is uh, the next one is emission security. So we're talking about um, both. Yeah, you know, the ability to preserve your receiver from being jammed, or protect your receiver from being jammed, uh, or to uh, prevent the adversary's uh, um, EW support systems or their SIGINT systems from from finding you or seeing you. So I talked about earlier. There's directional antennas. There's using terrain masking, so like a big mountain between you and where the enemy, you know, receivers uh, collection systems are. Um, Low, the lowest power that you need to use, those kinds of things. Uh, the, I saw the other day some amazing number, like the Ukrainians are losing 20,000 drones a day uh, due to jamming, right? So it's not being shot down or you know, bad pilots or something like that. It's really done by Russian jamming. Russians are kind of renowned for electronic warfare and you know, the sophistication of their electronic warfare systems. Uh, and so, you know, Knowing that 20,000 drones a day, doing the forensics, figuring out why are we uh, why are we losing these things, and then basically, you know, electronics, amateur electronics uh, hobbyists uh, of you know coming up with ways to basically uh, preserve the signal that they need in order to fly their drones into these EW uh, areas where they're getting overwhelmed by EW signals. Anybody do hack a day? Hack a day? No. Everybody go to hackaday.com and sign up. But uh, one of the ones on Hackaday, actually this morning, which I didn't get into this brief because I saw it shortly before I walked in here, was uh, Starlink. Starlink has its GPS uh, receiver is on the chip. And so that GPS receiver is kind of like hardwired when you get the Starlink terminal. That's how it knows where it is on the planet through the GPS receiver that and radio that's on the uh, that's on the chip inside the motherboard, you know, in the in the system. Uh, that's being jammed by the Russians, the Starlink. And so if you don't know where you are on the planet uh, for a Starlink terminal, it uh, it complicates the ability to use it uh, for communications, for C2. And so the Hackaday um, hack for this morning was basically bypassing the GPS that's on the chip uh, to put, a, uh, to put a, a different GPS receiver, an external GPS receiver uh, onto a Starlink terminal. So you can go like go on your phone right now and find it, and everybody in Ukraine that has uh, that has a Starlink terminal can get that as well. Modify their Starlink terminal, and then you know then one more turn on the wheel. Now the Leapfrog and the Russians have to uh, to come up with something uh, to counter that. So uh, yeah, any any comments or questions on emission security, Ariel? Curious, with that capability, do you think that that's offering the base station the opportunity to use different uh, GPS uh, constellations? For example, uh, you have GLONASS, you've got obviously GPS here in the States. Um, is that kind of opening things up a little bit? Yep. So, so the one that I saw this morning was, uh, was for GPS, um, but there's no reason you couldn't modify it for GLONASS or BIDO or any of the other uh, 
uh, other ones. Good. Yeah, and there's uh, there's actually one of the students here did a thesis on uh, on just using Starlink to self locate without using GPS. Just kind of the same idea of how GPS works uh, by the multiple uh, Leo satellites and the time difference of arrival of the signal, being able to geolocate yourself just using uh, Starlink. Okay, next slide. Uh, so transmission security. So I talked about you know don't use Walk about radios that are unencrypted uh, or any other kind of transmission security and expect that you know that you're not going to be intercepted and your message decoded and uh, exploited. And so this is uh, the the Ukrainians you know, using their own indigenous manufacturing capability uh, to come up with their own frequency hopping radios. So um, unlike the American uh, uh, Palm process and uh, the PPBE and our acquisition system, the federal acquisition regulation, like they're they're banging these out in you know their garage kind of thing, 3D printing the cases, uh, sending the plans around, and uh, and they're able to make their own you know unique uh, kind of exquisite um, frequency hopping radios that uh, that defeat the Russians' ability to find them, uh, intercept them, geolocate them. Next slide. All right, favorite, favorite slide. You won't be able to hear the cool music. That's the only thing you're missing here. I'll pause it real sec. So uh, physical security, anybody uh, trained or exposed to maybe tactical site exploitation? Okay, so tactical site exploitation is, uh, you know, is super popular in Iraq and Afghanistan. You go and you do some sort of mission. Uh, at the end of the mission, then you go in and you basically you know, look through the location where you want to see if there are things of intelligence value. So those things of intelligence value are, you know, thumb drives and, um, you know, papers and uh, videos and weapons and everything else. But one of the most important things are the communications technologies. So uh, I was in a uh, commando camp in Kuwait when the uh, OIF-1 kicked off and we crossed the berm and went into Iraq. And I was at Radio Battalion. I was at uh, at One Mef G2 as the SIGINT guy. And um, yeah, we, like that night, we had a bunch of Marines that came by with like cardboard boxes filled with Russian radios, Soviet radios that they had yanked out of tanks. And I like I had to like cast my memory back to like SIGINT school or whatever it is, but to pull the frequencies off them to get the model number of the radio and then find out like what. You can find out the frequency spectrum they use and what frequency they're on. You can exploit the crypto in them, those kinds of things. So physical security, you know, as a, as a communications officer, you know, if you lose track of your, uh, your communications equipment or you lose track of the uh, crypt cryptographic equipment or anything else, uh, it becomes a real liability, especially if you don't know that it happened. Because then somebody is inside your net with your radio and your crypto, you know, listening to you as you issue orders and as you're getting reports uh, without you knowing about it. And so basically it's shooting fish in a barrel or whatever. So, um, yeah, so so I thought this one was especially clever. So what you're going to see is a uh, can you pause it? Sure. Thank you. What you're going to see is a, uh, uh, the Ukrainians uh, did an artillery strike on a Russian position. So you'll see some trenches and some fighting holes. Uh, I think they blur out the dead Russians that are there, but they're going in to do battle damage assessment to see whether or not the target that they were servicing was actually, you know, hit and uh, and you know killed or uh, made mission ineffective kind of thing. Um, so that was the main purpose. But while they were there, they found something that was uh, even more useful. So this is uh, obviously a drone. You can see the shadow up at the top. And then it's looking at another drone. Can you guys see that from back there? Yeah. Yep. And then pause it real quick, Rex. Sure. And so uh, anybody ever do the claw game at, uh, at the arcade or whatever it is? So this second drone that it was looking at has a claw uh, and it's a little grappling hook. And the thing right there to the left uh, is a Russian uh, tactical radio, squad level tactical radio. 
sitting on the ground at the end of the, you know, the Russian guy's outstretched fingers or whatever. Go ahead. So frustrating for anyone that can't do the claw game at. Uh... Got by the antenna. Yep. And so it grabs the radio and then flies back to Ukrainian headquarters uh, where they, they don't have to do anything, right? They just plug it into a power source and start listening. And so uh, in true Ukrainian fashion, about two weeks after this happened, after the Russians, I don't think they realized that their crypto had been compromised. It was just time to roll crypto and go on to a new uh, 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 encryption segment. Uh, and so like after they swapped over their crypto, the Ukrainians put something out on Twitter that was like, hey, thanks for not changing your crypto. They posted this video and said, we've been listening to you for the last two weeks, which does two things. One, you know, taunts your enemy or whatever it is, but it also destroys trust and slows down your OODA loop because you're not sure whether you're being listened to or not. Okay, next slide. Yeah, anything else on, uh, on kind of the EW201 piece? All right. EW301, this starts to get into uh, more sophistication. And I think, go ahead. So I think the, uh, you know, the, the, the point that I would make here is within the military and especially for the SIGINTERS, you know, like I, I, you know, I could tell you, but I have to kill you or that's top secret SCI. I can't share that with you or something like that. Uh, but the real power is appreciating all these different capabilities, whether it's the drone pilots and hey, instead of uh, flying a kamikaze drone into it or doing ISR, I can go pick stuff up with a grappling hook. Uh, or it's doing this multi-int fusion where you have uh, people that are clever, that are bringing together electronic warfare, signals intelligence, imagery intelligence, uh, human intelligence, uh, and fires all, all in one piece. So go ahead. So what, what you see here is... Um, Go back and click the video, please. There you go. Yep. Does that blow up if you up? Yeah. yeah can you do that? Does that work? Yeah. Cool. Oh, this is the one. So. <laughs> so they. So the Ukrainians intercepted the video coming on. They didn't intercept the the control. You know, given its GPS location or its heading and speed and everything else. They picked up the video feed and they were watching it real time because it's unencrypted on a commercial drone. And so they were watching at the same time the Russian operator was watching, they were watching. And then the Russian operator flew his drone back to his base. When it flew back to his base, this was uh, apparent in the picture, which is it's a radio antenna, but it also has two directional antennas on it. And those directional antennas are at the right, uh, you know, cut to the right length, they're the right frequency range uh, to basically be the relay, you know, to extend the range of the drone. And then he's pointing to the cable that runs down the mast, you know, this uh, antenna mast and into the building. And, and I, I wish I had the, um, the audio because it's, uh, he's got some funny mannerisms as he's walking you through it. And then basically they watched that building now because they know that's where the, uh, the drone operators are. Uh, and then struck it with an artillery strike. So brought together four, five, six different things uh, to to have you know a successful engagement. Again, two things: they won't be flying drones again. Uh, the other one is it destroys trust and it reduces you know your ability to kind of operate without fear of being killed or whatever if uh, if you're a Russian drone operator, which makes you much more tentative uh, and hesitant to. Uh, to you know, execute your mission uh, if you weren't kind of you know paranoid that way. Okay, next slide. All right, this starts. Maybe this is similar to what Rex was talking about before, but uh, no, it is is this electronic warfare or not? But uh, it is over the RF, uh, and it's basically psychological operations over the RF, and and not shocking, right? Like, why would you not do this? Which is uh, you can get into the uh, cell system. The Russians are known to have brought um, portable cell systems, set it up. It basically spoofs the real tower. And then your phone, when you turn on your phone, it doesn't connect to the real tower. It connects to the Russian tower. They get all the information, including your phone number. 
Uh, and then now they have the database and they can start, you know, sending you threatening messages or whatever. So we always, you know, we talk about information operations and, you know, what's the first thing that's going to happen when the PRC and the United States get in a hot war? You know, it's probably me getting an email, you know, of, that somebody's threatening my family or I can't get my money out of the ATM or I get a, you know, a text message. It says your bank account's just been drained or whatever it is. And it's not just me. It's like everyone that's getting those things. And you don't know what's true anymore. And so electronic warfare provides you this conduit into the cognitive dimension uh, of, uh, of your adversary. Okay, next. All right, last one and then, uh, and then I'm done, uh, which is what is EW anyway? And this one uh, is, you know, starts to blend the EW and cyber piece together. This one, has anyone heard of this before? This fancy bear D30 thing? So it was a uh, Ukrainian uh, programmer, like hacker, whatever, a guy that just writes programs for his cell phone. Uh, and he realized like D30s, the artillery, towed artillery system that the Ukrainians were using in order to do a fire mission. It was like two or three minutes to do a fire mission. And so he's like, hey, you know what we could do? Like, just bring up a map. Uh, I'll, I'll know where I am on the map. I'll touch where I want to shoot on the map. And then it will predict, you know, it will uh, generate you know, exactly the, uh, you know, what the fire mission, what I should lay on the gun in order to drop around on that position. Pretty cool. So it went from two and a half or three minutes down to like 30 seconds to do a fire mission. Unfortunately, when you brought up that map and it put a little dot where you are, it sent an email to the Russians of where you were. And so they had, you know, it was basically a Trojan horse that was relaying. And so, you know, all of the fire missions, you know, coming back the other direction, uh, eliminated, you know, half of the D-30s that uh, that the Ukrainians had. So they figured this out, you know, and not instantly, but you know, pretty quickly they figured that out. But it, you know, again, it goes back to um, both the immediate battlefield effects, but also the long-term effects of, you know, what can you trust and what can you not trust uh, on the battlefield. My last bullet on there is algorithmic warfare. Anybody familiar with that term? Awesome. I just made it up. No, I didn't. So uh, Project Maven. This is the idea that um, you know uh, AI and the use of algorithms that uh, like e electronic warfare. There's a protect part of that. There's an attack part of that, and then there's some sort of exploitation part of that to support the attack and the protect part of that. And I don't I don't have a slide for it. I don't have anything for it. But if anybody is interested in like helping to describe what that is, I think that's the future. So we had EW, then we have cyber warfare. So you have offensive cyber, defensive cyber, and uh, exploitative cyber. And we're gonna have the same thing with, a, uh, with AI in the future, probably blending in with the other two, electronic warfare uh, and cyberspace operations or cyber warfare. All right, 1248, what do, you what do you have? Deep thoughts, anything else that you've seen that you think is clever? Yeah, go ahead, I'll run to you, start. Uh, about, about the, uh, the info ops, because uh, I mean, if you set up like those like uh, fake towers, uh, I mean, it's like, like I can understand like a 1G, 2G, but you're talking about like 4G or even 5G, they, they have like uh, authentication on both sides. So how how was that? How, how did this happen? So I don't know, or I can't say. Um... But the you know the the technology itself are you know the 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 same companies that make the towers that were installed in Ukraine are the same companies that the Russians can go and buy you know other towers from, and then uh, it, depending on how sophisticated the security is for the for the handsets themselves and for that network uh, depends on you know how easy or hard it will be. So. Yes, I, I I don't know the specifics, but I look forward to reading your thesis where you figure this out. <laughs> All right, need next game. Okay. Uh, sir, going back to the video where the drone is picking up a Russian handheld squad radio. Um, in the defense, you know, we got rid of the uh, the wireman MOS in the Marine Corps, but has there been any thought or like any evidence of Ukrainian usage, especially in the defense of using comm wire and not transmitting via radio at all? Yeah, I, I don't know. Does anybody know the answer to that question? 
Yeah. I mean, it's for, you need, uh, back to your earlier question, you just need to expand your portfolio to your assets. You can't just be sucked into his Harris radio all the time. Like, it's my one way to communicate. I need to talk VHF. If you read the comm manual, we say TACnet is VHF. Well, we got to get away from that. We just got to continue to expand our portfolio of ways to communicate. Like, if you got fiber, use fiber. Yeah, it, interestingly, um, <clears throat> I think the, the book is called War Secrets in the Ether, and it's about the Germans in World War II and their signals intelligence service. But it starts in World War One, and they were actually doing intercept of wire. So, uh, uh, yeah, so using the, um, uh, 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 basically a wire network laid out in the no man's land, they were able to get induction over the currents going through the other wires and do signals intelligence intercept over wire. That's just nifty, but I but I don't think, you know, doesn't apply now, but if you're using fiber optic or you have another option, I think it's, you know, understand the threat and understand your vulnerabilities. Oh, hey, can you get my last slide? Yeah, next one, next one, one more, keep going. You're going backwards. Oh, the last slide. The last slide, yeah, sorry. Uh, go back, one more, back one. All right, yeah, don't suck, right? Uh, and then, you know, exploit every opportunity that you have to, uh, to make the enemy pay, um, you know, kill the dumb ones first, I guess, whatever. And then you'll just be left with smart ones and then you'll have to deal with that. Um, and then really, you know, th this, whether you're a communications officer or a SIGIN officer or something else, this is everybody's business, electronic warfare. And so, you know, treat it as a battlefield capability, just like, you know, uh, you know, hiding your physical signature through camouflage and everything else uh, that you should treat this as both a vulnerability and a capability. And then, uh, you know, understand who does EW. You have the radio battalions in the Marine Corps. You have uh, multi, what do they call multi-domain, help me, multi-domain task force in the Army. Uh, you have Crippies in the Navy. Uh, they can help you understand, you know, EW, get a good understanding of capabilities and limitations and risks. And then, um, you know, and then the ability to integrate that into your plan, no matter what your job is, logistician, infantry officer, uh, SWO, SEAL, all of those kinds of things. Uh, I believe, you know, as things move more and more into the digital realm and certainly distributed operations and everything else, you know, exploiting the RF spectrum, exploiting the electromagnetic spectrum is going to be critical capability uh, more than ever has been in the past. Sorry. Um, so it appears to me that Ukraine has done a pretty successful job of integrating commercial software and commercial equipment over the past few years to counter these advanced Russian equipment capabilities. Do you think the United States is learning from that lesson in an, on an appropriate timeline? And how do you see that, if not manifesting itself over the next two or three years to catch up? Yeah, I think their risk calculus is different. You know, they, uh, they're in a uh, existential situation every day. And so their tolerance for risk, you know, even something like the fancy bear thing, like, hey, that was a, that was a tragedy. But, you know, if that's what we had to do to survive. Uh, so the Ukrainians are in one place in time and situation. Uh, we're in a different one, but I think the Defense Innovation Unit, Marine Innovation Unit, the um, uh, the Raider Initiative, the um, Replicator, all of these different things, the United States is looking at how do we do something similar to this. Um, managing, what's the right word? Yeah, ma managing risk intelligently. Not preventing risk, but managing risk, because you know uh, slowness is risk. Sometimes speed, even if it's you know an eighty percent solution or there's uh, flaws in whatever it is that you're doing, speed gives you the advantage that you need in order to you know for it to be less risky than if you'd just been deliberate and slow about it. Yeah, I'm an optimist. That's why I'm why I'm an MPS. You guys will figure it out. All right. Last word. I know you guys gotta go. Cool. Great. Thanks very much. Have a good one.